Okay, so... This is kind of weird, guys. <laughs> yeah, no, here, here we go. So, hello, can you give us your name and your title at the Southern Nevada Climbers Coalition? Yeah, my name is Lisey Hendricks, and I am the president of the Southern Nevada Climbers Coalition. And what do you do at Climbing Gold? I am the executive producer, so I try to wrangle you guys. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so you're our boss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How's wrangling us going? I mean, there are good days and bad days, uh, but for the most part, you guys are pretty easy. The Southern Nevada Climbers Coalition is what people call a local climbing organization, and there are over 100 local climbing organizations across the United States because there's so many climbing areas and people have to actively be involved in those climbing areas in order to protect them. And the locals are clearly the best people to be involved there because they're on the ground. They're the ones that know what's happening. They're the ones that can have the relationships with land managers that you need to have in order to protect climbing areas. So what does your job at SNCC entail? We educate climbers about how to behave outdoors. We do trail work. We do crag maintenance. We rebolt climbing areas. We also host community events and kind of throw parties and help people kind of come together and, and have a fun time. So uh, how much do you get paid for that work? Zero dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and, and would you um, say that's a, a fair, <laughs> fair compensation for the amount of work? <laughs> No. I mean, there are some local climbing organizations that people do get paid for the work that they do and their actual full-time jobs. Unfortunately, this is not one of them. <laughs> While we do have one of the largest climbing areas in the U.S. in our backyard, we don't have as many local climbers. And so we don't have enough money to support the organization to actually pay the people that do the work. The Bureau of Land Management here in Nevada estimates that over 200,000 climbers come to Red Rocks every single year, and yet we only have a few thousand local climbers. And so there you know, are a few thousand local climbers trying to support and clean up after over 200,000 climbers that are showing up here every year. So nearly 60% of climbing in the U.S. takes place on public lands. So that means national parks, state lands, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, or BLM. Think Yosemite, Indian Creek, Red Rock, all the places we've talked about in the show. These lands, they're overseen by the government and managed for a variety of uses and purposes. Preservation of ecosystems, recreation, which means climbing, hunting and game management, grazing, and oil, gas, timber, and mining. In theory, these lands, they're managed for the benefit of the American people. The people in charge, land managers, they typically got a lot on their plates, a lot of competing things to worry about, and not a lot of resources to do it. And sometimes they, they don't really know what to do with climbers. It's a high-impact sport, much more so than hiking, much more so than just kind of roaming around, camping in the woods even. We are bolting cliffs. We're, we're um, you know, regularly creating new trail. We're like staging at the, you know, the side of a cliff. And so that creates a lot of erosion and impact. And I think, you know, as climbing is growing, we have to be really, really careful to show land managers that we're willing to step up. And a lot of the things that we need to do in order to maintain crags are kind of highly specialized you know, we can't ask the U.S. Forest Service or the BLM to go rebolt crags for us. You know, we have to explain to them how to stage landing areas and bouldering areas. We're the ones that have to, you know, help them with building the appropriate erosion, anti-erosion setup at sport climbing cliffs. We have to tell them where the trails are, the best trails are to get to trad climbing areas. They don't know all of that stuff. And if we can partner with them and, and help them with our expertise, we're going to make recreating in these places a lot better and a lot easier. And they're going to be more willing to work with us when issues arise versus just shutting down the climbing. It's really, really important for climbers as a user group to kind of stand up and say, hey, we care about this. We care about this type of recreation on this you know, public land that we all own. And we're going to stand up and help you all manage that. You know, I, I think from a 
climber's perspective, it's easy just to show up at the crag and feel like you're out in the middle of nowhere in the empty desert, just doing what you want to do. And it all feels incredibly free and, and unregulated. I mean, I don't think there's a question there. I'm just like, that is an interesting point. <laughs> I'm like, you know, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've been climbing 25 years or so. And I think for the first 20, I was pretty much oblivious to land management at all. You know, I was just going outdoors. You think of the forest as being sort of this eternal, it's the forest. And you're like, no, the forest is actually owned by the federal government and being managed by the U.S. Forest Service. And you're allowed to climb there because of the work of these land managers and these access organizations. And, you know, basically a whole team of people have come together to enable you to use that area. Yeah, exactly. In this first season of Climbing Gold, we brought you stories from climbing legends, people who push standards, rethought how we approached our sport, chased the edges of human potential, and laid their lives on the line to realize a vision. They progressed our sport by leaps and bounds. But if you were to ask, what's the single most important moment in American climbing? The answer, it might surprise you. In the early 90s, we got pretty close to banning climbing outright because bolting had started to kind of be a bigger thing. And I think land managers just weren't sure how to manage the sport and climbers weren't stepping up to have relationships with those land managers. It was sort of shifting from being a very anti-authoritarian, like, you know, fuck you style attitude to, you know, the recognition that the sport was growing and that, that we were making it more accessible by, by bolting cliffs. So we could have lost it all during that time period had it not been for the vision of people like Armando Manical. If he hadn't kind of stepped up alongside, you know, several other people that founded the Access Fund and said, hey, we've got to do something about this, we could have lost climbing forever. Today we talked to Armando Manical about the moment when a few key people got together to save the future of climbing. And the crazy thing is, a lot of their peers were pretty angry about it. You probably never heard of Armando's name, but his skill, dogged determination, and belief in our sport helped preserve it for generations to come. Our executive producer, Lisey Hendricks, helps us out. I'm Alex Honnold. I'm Fitz Cahal. This is Climbing Gold. Chapter eight, give and take. My life has really followed sort of the reverse of the climbing lifestyle. You know? <laughs> Here's Armando Menical. I started as a professional, raised a family, <laughs> uh, worked as, uh, as a lawyer for 25 to 30 years, and then became a climbing bum and full-time climber <laughs> for the next 15 to 20 years of my life. I now live in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and in uh, Cuba. So how did you start climbing in, in 1969? Oh, I would uh, graduated from law school. I was living in San Francisco. I was part of probably every one of the political movements of the time. Everything except the summer of love. Uh, I never got into drugs. Maybe that's because I found climbing instead. And I just went to visit a friend in Colorado. He took me up scrambling and he said, we'd done technical climbing. Got back home, called the Sierra Club. And they said, we got a rock climbing section, meets at Mount Dam every weekend. And that's how I started. It was almost all trad climbing. I spent 10 years, just almost every, every part of summer possible climbing the friction in Tuolumne Meadows, uh, I think by after about 10 years, I climbed every crack I could. <laughs> I have to emphasis on the I could. What kind of law were you practicing then? Well, I graduated from law school and then went out and joined a big firm in San Francisco, mainly because they were the only people who would pay my way across the country and then uh, paid it for me to take the bar exams. I didn't have any money. But after a couple of years, I saw no future there. And I, I, I went and became a poverty lawyer working in the... Latino Barrio in San Francisco, and then later on went to work in, with uh, rural agriculture workers in, in California, and then became a civil rights lawyer. 
maybe it developed over a long time, sort of a um, openness to take uh, chances and risks. And while Armando was building his law career in the Bay Area, he was also getting out almost every weekend. He was part of the climbing community, a member of the American Alpine Club. He learned to ice climb, backcountry ski. He loved the delicate run-out face climbing of Tuolumne Meadows. Yeah, when I first started climbing in about 69, 70, it really was the end of the golden era in Yosemite Valley. That first time of Royal Robbins and Montchenard and the like. So there was no suggestion of sport climbing and, and no one would have called Tuolumne Meadows sport climbing. It wasn't for another 10 years, really. In the early 1970s, the clean climbing revolution brought free climbing into vogue. While athleticism became a part of the sport, stylistically, bold, dangerous free climbing became the cutting edge standard to the point that it stunted a lot of the athletic advances because there was absolutely no room for failure. We covered a lot of that in chapter two. The pendulum was about to swing in the opposite direction. Sport climbing, today, it seems so ubiquitous. At the time, though, it was considered a radical, heretical version of climbing that challenged the very core of what it meant to be a climber. Now most people just call it fun. In the U.S., sport climbing first appeared at Smith Rock in Oregon. The beautiful faces between the cracks could safely be bolted by rappelling in. Alan Watts, who was driving force behind Smith's Rock's development and a pioneer in American climbing, would go from an unknown outsider to one of the strongest climbers in the U.S. in a few-year period. His backwater choss pile was capturing international attention. J.B. Trebeau, the Frenchman who said that no woman would ever climb 514, came over to put up the country's first 514A to bolt or not to be. In the 80s, when sport climbing started, there were two big changes. The first change was the climbing just grew in difficulty. I mean, it was a, (laughs) to those of us that have been climbing by that time, 10 to 15 years, I mean, it was just a huge jump in the difficulty of what was being climbed. But also what happened was the places that we climbed changed. I mean, there were, you know, there were the iconic places, Yosemite, the Gunks, Tetons, and the like where people climbed. But once sport climbing came along, particularly with power drills, city, county parks, state parks, any little crag that was 50 to 70 feet high. So, I mean, having a power drill allows you to put up safer, more convenient, basically more tightly bolted routes. And that allows you to prioritize things like safety and and ease of use. Suddenly, new areas like Smith, Rifle, the Red River Gorge, and Red Rock were the focus of a new generation. The status quo had shifted. These land managers suddenly had people climbing there all the time. And they were the first ones to start crying uncle. And they had no idea, you know, how to police this. I mean, they were used to teenagers on Saturday night having beer parties. And all of a sudden, they've got people doing this to them dangerous adventure called climbing. And so one of the first things they started doing was closing and prohibiting climbing. It was just all across the country. After the break, tensions flare. And we throw Portland, Oregon's local crag under the bus. Alex, um, listening to Armando, it got me thinking, like, it's a really weird moment in, in our history. In Yosemite or Rocky Mountain National Park, beforehand, you know, the rangers knew what climbing was. They were sort of expecting it. And it's, it's you know, it's been there for decades. But, uh, you know, this is a period where it's the 1980s and climbing is totally fringe and it's kind of weird and kind of crazy. Yeah. All of a sudden, if you're like in some sort of backwoods forest service district and there's like people in neon colored tights showing up, you're like, <laughs> what the fuck is happening? Right. Yeah, you know, like fucking hippies <laughs> trespassing on my farm. Yeah. 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 It's kind of yeah. wild. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, like, could you just like sort of like right? funny, when you, when you mentioned that I just sort of Rolodex through my mind of scrappy little sport crags around the country that I've been to that are 
pieces of rock that could never have been developed without the the boom in sport climbing. You know, pieces of rock that couldn't be climbed traditionally, don't take gear, are basically terrible rock, but with with enough bolts and with a little bit of glue have sort of turned into fun outdoor gyms, essentially. And and there are many of those around the country. I mean, I immediately thought of this crack called the Rat Cave outside of Portland, which is just this truly horrific little piece of rock. It is. But, you I, know, has become yes. a, a great little sport climbing area. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and and that to me is a perfect example of a crag that you can see how sport climbing would suddenly have an impact there. I mean, because that whole area where you park for, for that crag is all sort of scenic, you know, and it's like kind of touristy and there are like waterfalls nearby. And and if you suddenly have a bunch of cars parking and like, why are they going there? <laughs> why are they spending the whole day power screaming? <laughs> you're like, sa ha, you know, you're like, oh, it's so weird that there's screams coming out of the forest now. I wasn't into sport climbing at all. I wouldn't have considered myself a good enough climber <laughs> at that time. The circumstances that drew me into defending sport climbing, it wasn't planned. People knew Armando's legal background. In the mid 80s, there were just so many closures that were um, facing the climbing community. And I got involved in a couple of people asked me to help in California. I did it. And then uh, American Alpine Club asked me to form a, a committee, an access committee to defend access. I did it for about five years and it just grew enormously. But it was a very tense time. Like, why was there such a rift within the climbing community about the placement of bolts? Several aspects of it. First of all, they weren't always, in fact, usually were not being placed ground up. So it changed the nature of how people viewed the allocation between difficulty and risk. You know, bolts changed the risk factor of climbing. It also allowed people to climb so much harder stuff. But the idea of rehearsing routes, practicing them over and over, wrap bolting, and power drills, which were a really big part of it because it allowed a, a lot broader group of people to be those that were part of the first ascent community. You could be a, a not very experienced climber with a power drill and rat bolting, be putting up routes, which is not, it not always a good idea. But if you were, you know, someone in a remote place in Indiana and there was a 50 foot crag and there were no other, or maybe just you and a one or two other young people that were climbing, it made a difference. You were you were able to become a climber and put up routes that, that you and your friends could climb. And there were people that were traditionalists that uh, opposed that. It did become a battle down at the individual climber level. I you know, I had at least two good friends that were climbing partners. Uh, one of them, for example, I'll, I'll mention his name, Tom Higgins. Tom was a good friend. Boy, I there was no one I admired more in his ability as a climber. His footwork when we go to Indian Rock and Berkeley and practice was just incredible. And Tom was just completely opposed to sport climbing and rat bolting and those techniques. And I, I never got to climb with Tom again. John Backer <laughs> had a fight, fist fight. John always claimed he was sucker punched in a dispute with some climbers over putting up sport routes on some small crags in Yosemite. The schism would result in what we now call the Bolt Wars. It kind of would go something like this. Across the country, an eager route developer would put up a new route at a crag that might have a few existing trad routes at it, but a whole lot of potential. And another climber who would become morally outraged by the bolts and often you know, like trad climbing more, was a traditionalist, they'd come along at night and steal the hangers or hack the bolts out. And in some cases, it would go back and forth. Bolts go in, bolts get chopped, bolts get put back in, and it would just go back and forth on and on. And it was pretty lame. And the number of climbers actually participating in this kind of behavior was few, but the impact, it was huge. And it could get like insanely ridiculous. At one of the places I learned to climb, uh, Vantage out in eastern Washington, uh, there was this ongoing spat between a few of the people um, and Vantage is this columnar basalt cliff. So there's like these big sort of columns and some of them kind of can get detached from the main wall. And the trad climbers um, 
there was a bolted sport lineup, one of these detached pillars. And so like one night they went out and they took like an industrial truck jack, like for changing tires. And they put it between the column and the main wall and just kept prying it off until the whole column, uh, like a whole hundred foot column basically got knocked over. And it kind of like even gets a little bit crazier because like they they actually brought a mannequin out and I think that they must have clipped it to a bolt or something uh, so that when the column fell over, it looked like it crushed somebody, you know, like there were like legs sticking out underneath the column when people showed up the next day. And, you know, they called called the sheriffs. Uh, it, it was just like a bad scene. And the problem is that's just laying the worst of the climbing community out before the land managers, you know. They didn't understand a lot of the ethics dispute, but they, they clearly understood that they didn't want people placing bolts and other people coming along and chopping them out. You know, when you think of the sort of really well-known stories of bolt wars in, in places like Yosemite, you see somebody like John Backer, who's a really staunch traditionalist, and, and you can see how he would feel threatened if, if standards are rising and the type of climbing that he is uniquely good at is no longer relevant. You know, it's like, obviously, he's going to hold on to, to what he's best at. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine a different world in which a few of the leading traditional climbers of their time, people like John Backer, or or even somebody like Royal Robbins, you know, from the previous generation, or Warren Harding, let's say, if some of the, the leading luminaries had embraced sport climbing and made a public stance that this was good for the sport and good for standards and, and that, uh, you know, for Americans to climb at the highest level, they have to embrace this new uh, model of climbing. You know, you can imagine it all would have gone quite differently. But that's just not not the world we live in. People today, it's it's hard for climbers to recognize how divided the climbing community was in those years. I mean, I lost a couple of my good climbing partners that re, you know, re, <laughs> they were just so upset that we were defending people who you know placed bolts. And not just that, there was a whole series of ethical dilemma, you know, you know, rap bolting, rehearsing, chalk, ex- uh, you know, they thought excessive chalk use. And these were mostly ethical debates, which were fine. But when so many climbers tried to take their ethical objections to land managers and say, you should prohibit this. And that was what was happening. One side of the climbing community, mostly young people, was also a generational difference. One is sport climbing and wanted to be able to put up routes. Another part of the climbing community was really opposed and blamed them for the closures. And within the American Alpine Club, unfortunately, our committee became very controversial because we took the position that we would defend all climbing. That questions of rap bolting, rehearsal, those are all ethical questions to be resolved solely within the climbing community. Land managers had no business getting involved. And the best way to defend climbing was to defend all climbing. And we were being pushed to literally throw the sport climbers under the bus. And we refused to do that. Was there internal debate at the AAC about that? I mean, how did you guys? Oh, Oh, yes. (laughs) The AAC got a new board president who supported what the Access Committee was doing. But he did it by making sure no one would ever vote on what Armando was up to. He told Armando, I'll back you 100% during my three-year term. But after that, Armando was left with a choice. You know, the AEC was that time. It's very different now. Back then, it was like an old boys club. Literally old boys. (laughs) There were very few women. They literally started disowning what what the access committee was doing. They'd go behind our back to land managers and say, That's not our position. And so finally, the few of us who I had recruited by then, we just sort of backed off and said, well, you know, if we're going to work on access, we just might as well do it on our own. We don't need the AAC. And so within a year, we made the decision uh, about 1990 that we would be better off just starting our own separate organization, the Access Fund. How did that play out? Well, it was emotional. It was almost strange. We had two groups on the AAC board, we had people who were strong supporters of what our work, and they wanted us to stay. And then there were people who opposed what we were doing, and they were quite happy to see us go. <laughs> but 
it really didn't end the controversy, though, Alex. You know, I mean, the problem was that uh, the, the division between us and the AAC was the division that existed in the entire climbing community. Were you and the the other early leaders of, of the Access Fund, were you developing routes? Like, were, were you personally vested in this? Most of us were not sport climbers. Um, some of us, the part of doing going through the process became, we liked it. We learned that sport climbing was fun. <laughs> but we weren't the people placing the bolts. I had probably placed a half a dozen bolts myself in doing a first modest amount of first ascents. But what... I recognized from the beginning that what was at stake was climbers' freedom and independence. If we couldn't decide the style in which we were going to climb something and the level of risk that we would accept or not accept, part of the essence of the sport would be lost. Starting a new organization comes with startup costs, and the Access Committee had benefited from the deep pockets of the old boy network. Armando and his collaborator, Jim Angel, who has since passed away, faced a huge hurdle immediately. We only had two part-time employees at, as the committee. They were paid, frankly, by one major donor. You know, every year I would just call him and say, we need money to run the uh, access committee. And his reply would always be how much and when. And he, you know, he basically funded us for uh, three or four years that way. It was uh, always referred to as the call. <laughs> that call, it was placed to Yvonne Chouinard, Yosemite pioneer, inventor of clean climbing, staunch environmentalist, founder of Patagonia. Three months after we started, I was sitting in his office with him and he said, you know, I'm not giving you any more money as long as you guys keep defending bolting. So our sole donor <laughs> pulled the rug out from under us as we were starting. So it was not an auspicious start. <laughs> In hindsight, it was actually a good, a good thing that happened because that next meeting we had of the access fund, we had to decide what we were going to do. You know, and there were some people saying, gosh, maybe, maybe we should back off a little bit on the bolting thing. But after a short discussion, everyone said, no, you know, we're not going to be much of an organization if all it takes is one person telling us that uh, he's going to yank uh, the rug out for much under us and our money. So we just knuckled down and got to work to survive. And those first, I would say, three to four years were very, very hard. More than one person took out second mortgages to meet uh, paychecks. We relied, I would say, predominantly on our survival on the outdoor industry. You know, corporations weren't used to giving money to organizations. AEC had almost no corporate sponsors. But uh, the access from the, from the beginning, the industry said, well, wait a minute, these guys are these guys are doing what we need to be done. And that's defending climbing and keeping uh, areas open. And so from the very beginning, we were dependent on the outdoor industry. If we hadn't had their support in those first three or four years, I, I doubt we would have made it. After the break, the future of American climbing gets decided by a few key words in a legal document. Almost 60% of climbing happens on public lands. How how close did we come to, to seeing that all disappear? Yeah, I'm one of those people who thinks it really, we came extremely close to losing a good bit of climbing. It was bolts being prohibited, but it was also the closures. There were so many places that were uh, closing climbing. What were some of the big closures or, or bolting bans early on? One of the first major ones was Waco Tanks. That was in the, toward the end of the 80s. Waco Tanks had both uh, uh, sport climbing routes. It also had uh, lots of bouldering, but they just closed it to all climbing. There were places in the desert like the Superstitions. In the 90s, there was um, all bolts were prohibited in the Sawtooth Mountains of uh, Idaho. 
We had a lot of controversies as City of Rocks was being developed. Those are probably the, right now to my mind, the, the big places, but there were so many small parks and areas being challenged and were being closed. I'm fairly certain it would have become the norm, the closures in a good part of almost all federal land management agencies, you know, the Forest Service, the Park Service, and the BLM. At the very least, bolts would have been prohibited. The battle eventually became particularly acute at what are called designated wilderness areas. And in Yosemite, everything above the 4,200 foot level is designated wilderness. So that would have meant no bolts on El Cap. It would have meant more than just not placing bolts. It would have meant that leaving the bolts there would have been prohibited. So if bolts would have been banned and designated wilderness as very came very close to happening by the mid nineties, not only would they have been no further bolting, there would have been in time, the removal of bolts. And if the major federal agencies had gone that way, uh, state and county and local parks eventually over time would have done that. And it would have changed the face of climbing. But some of those initial situations, like what happened at the superstitions where they immediately closed and prohibited all, all bolts. The superstition mountains are a wild, rugged area east of Phoenix. The superstitions are a, a somewhat unusual place. It's a, all these short, small crags. And wilderness starts at the parking lot. <laughs> it's about as close to a roadside crag as you can imagine, but it's still designated wilderness. And uh, the person who provoked it was a, uh, a photographer who just loved to take photos in the superstitions. And he finally got fed up because there were these people in the middle of all his photos of the crags. The photographer got the Sierra Club to raise the issue with the Forest Service, and the Forest Service prohibited all bolting. Those first ones were the opportunities for governments, particularly the federal government, to set policy. A good-sized place like the Superstitions had prohibited all bolts. Then other agencies would have looked at that, and when they suddenly saw a controversy happening, there's a very high likelihood they would have followed suit. Armando flew down to Phoenix and organized a walkthrough with various stakeholders. He brought in a professional facilitator for a set of working meetings where the Forest Service would begin to define its policy about bolts. This was a highly detailed process with a lot of legal documentations and definitions. They asked someone to write up a memo about what legally a bolt was. I immediately volunteered for that. <laughs> yeah. And I saw it was an opportunity. Uh, as I told you, the, the division in the climbing community was between people who, who supported bolts and those that opposed them. So a bolt is a permanent fixture. It gets left behind. And even the staunchest traditional climbers, the people that thought bolts were terrible and should be removed, they leave behind gear, though, too, because we all have to when we retreat from a route. There are fixed pitons, slings tied around trees to aid rappelling, bolted rappel anchors. The traditionalists wanted sport climbing banned, but not their anchors. So Armando, when he wrote that memo, instead of defining a bolt as a bolt and a hanger and a nut, he defined it as a fixed anchor, the same way you would a sling around a tree. It was a gamble. Now in the eyes of the government, there weren't sport climbers and trad climbers. There were just climbers. So if they banned sport climbing, they would ban all climbing. Now, everyone had skin in the game. That has remained to this today the definition that all the federal land management agencies use, which I think is good because it, it gives all of the climbing community a shared interest in being able to continue to use them where necessary. Did, did that feel like a stroke of genius for you at the time? No, it just seemed like a clever thing to do. <laughs> Uh, that that was a good thing to do. That's why my hand went up right away. <laughs> well, that small bit of writing, it didn't end all local squabbles, and bolts still get chopped from time to time. In general, though, it effectively ended the debate on a policy level, which gave climbers the ability to begin 
working on bigger things, to aligning with big conservation organizations like the Sierra Club and the National Parks Association. Climbers also compromised. They agreed to a ban on power drills and wilderness. In sensitive areas, they capitulated to reviews of new routes. Typically, our organizations now support big conservation efforts to protect land. And in turn, the big conservation groups typically support climbers' access. We were willing to, to go pretty far and compromise and be reasonable. And the land managers in general saw the same thing. And, but what came out of that by the end was that uh, we had a pretty good co- <laughs> a pretty good group of people that uh, continued to work for, uh, together for another 10 or 15 years. We, we have a privileged status and we have to be very careful about it and preserving it and exercising it responsibly. Looking back on the Access Fund, um, do you feel pride? You have to feel some pride for what you did. But I, I also feel a little awkward in thinking of the Access Fund as my legacy. It, it kind of feels like the carpenter who lays down a keel and then claims credit for building the ship. You know, those of us who started the Access Fund, we left an organization with a lot of spirit and a, a commitment to the mission of representing climbing in all its forms. But to be honest, we didn't leave much else. <laughs> Covered was pretty bare, particularly financially and resources. But today, I don't think any of us would recognize the organization. It's made up of 130 local climbing organizations, most of which the Access Fund built. Uh, it's got a several million dollar revolving fund that they've used to buy a couple dozen threatened climbing areas. They've got uh, three conservation teams that are out crossing the entire United States. Our advocacy work was defending climbing and it was primarily defending climbing on public lands. Well, today it, uh, the Access Fund still does that, but it's actually become a, a player in helping to defend public lands themselves. So I, I think what gives me the most personal satisfaction is watching successive generations of new leaders come into the Access Fund, uh, bring in their own ideas and commitment and take the organization in a new direction. That's what built all the local climbing clubs. That's what started all the uh, stewardship program, uh, the land acquisition fund. All those were programs that were built on the shoulders of what what started from before. Uh, and I, I, I think that at, as a personal level gives me the most pleasure is that somehow we managed to start something that was good enough that other people could take it over and uh, make it their own uh, passion, just as it had been for us. That is a pretty cool story. Um, Lisi, you you actually turned us on to Armando because you, uh, you worked at the Access uh, Fund for a long time. I started working at the Access Fund in 2009, and a few weeks after I started working there, we went to the outdoor retailer trade show, and I had no idea what I was doing, but it was my job to to manage all of our relationships with uh, the corporate partners there. So I showed up at the show, and it was like trial by fire, and Armando um, decided to also show up and come to every single meeting with me. And he really taught me how to talk to those partners <laughs> and how to just like give them a picture of what the Access Fund was up to and why the work we were doing was important. And I really just kind of developed a close relationship with him during that time. And throughout my seven or eight years of working at the Access Fund, I regularly called him when I needed support or needed help. Alex, we've obviously been covering some incredible moments in, in U.S. climbing history. And in some ways, the story, it's, it's like not totally a climbing story, but it also seems like maybe one of the most important climbing stories out there. I mean, I mean in some ways, what Armando and, and his peers did in founding the Access Fund is one of the most 
meaningful events in U.S. climbing history. I mean, it is important that we differentiate U.S. climbing history because obviously global climbing would have continued un- unchanged. But for the U.S., I mean, that's a big deal. I mean, it's hard to even imagine what would happen for climbing if it had been largely banned on public lands. I mean, on the one hand, you can imagine it not having that big an impact because gyms have taken over as the, the primary driver for growth and climbing. On the other hand, you can imagine it just completely crippling climbing because there wouldn't have been, a, you know, they're basically with nowhere to go climb. What's the point of getting into it? I mean, it's just, it's interesting because so much of climbing and climbing history, you know, can just be tied up to individuals doing specific things. But I think that this is one topic where we really have to think about, you know, our country as a collective of, of, you know, as a group coming together to decide how we want to lead our lives, basically, like, how do we want to use our land? I don't know. I mean, I think this is one of the fun things about climbing gold is to get into topics where you see climbing in the broader context of, of, you know, the human experience or whatever. You know, in a lot of ways, too, we've also really moved past the some of the issues of access. Like we've come to realize that there are bigger things impacting um, all of us, like, you know, more than a fixed anchor or something. Uh, Alex, you you've been to D.C. to lobby for public lands and climbing. And, um, you know, what, what was your takeaway from that experience? Actually, you know what you know what was so interesting for me about going to climb the hill and advocating on behalf of climbers, and uh, and this was actually my sister pointed this out to me, and she works for the Washington Trails Authority and she builds trails for a living basically, but uh, but she pointed out to me that I had become a special interest group because you know your whole life you grow up hearing about how special interest groups are lobbying Washington and that's and that's a bad thing, and then I go to Washington to meet with my my representatives to talk about you know climbing ad- access on public lands, and suddenly. I was like, oh, I'm a special interest group. Like, I'm the guy that I've spent my whole life thinking is like ruining politics. And, and you know, special interest could mean oil and gas exploration, or it could just mean, you know, knitters that want a safe space to knit together, because it's like, that is a special interest, you know, or, or climbers that want a cliff, you know, protected in perpetuity so they can, you know, climb with their kids there someday. You know, at this junction in time, we're thinking about the bigger picture a little bit because the climbing community is bigger and does have a louder voice and and has greater representation. It's less about the fixed anchors and the fact that there might be like an oil derrick in the middle of of your crag or, you know, like, I mean, even right now, uh, Oak Flat, you know, the Queen Creek area in Arizona. Yeah, it's it's like going to be a thousand foot crater, you know, and it got it got land transferred. And it's like all of a sudden it's like Queen Creek is a great example because a lot of boulders bicker internally about leaving tick marks on the rock or whether or not uh you know crash pads are are having too big an impact but when the entire bouldering area gets sold off to become a copper mine and then the whole thing becomes a gigantic pit in the ground to extract copper kind of like who cares if the tick mark on the crux hold was a little bit too long (laughs) because it's like the entire bouldering area is now gone like full stop has been turned into a copper mine you know, obviously not everyone is in a spot to, to fly to D.C. or to, um, you know, run a volunteer local climbing org. Um, and, you know, I don't know. There's just like ways to to participate in, in the community, right? This may be worth mentioning that doing what you can can also mean just being a member of the Access Fund and supporting the work financially. Because, you know, there are tons of folks who realistically aren't going out to build trails or build outhouses or do whatever else. But at the bare minimum, they can be supporting the access fund or supporting their local access organizations so that other people can do the work that needs to be done. That's a that's a that's a good point, because like I, I think we seem to be, um, you know, we work at our best as a community when we are like handle our business internally. Like, you know, we may not always agree about everything or we think things are cool, but like when we aren't like actively bickering, um, We've we've been able to do some pretty cool things collectively. Totally. Just anytime we we start kind of yelling at each other is when access truly gets lost. And and this is an example where we have to go participate, not just as individuals, but as a community in a bigger thing that's happening on a national level. Let let that be a lesson for the country as a whole, huh? Yeah. But you know, when there, there's when there's too much internal division, that's when things just sort of crumble. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That was dark. <laughs> well, I mean, kind of dark, but also sort of uplifting in a way. You, know, you just need <laughs> totally. a, a, a global access or a you know national access organization. 
that bring <laughs> yeah. people together. Well, I mean, or really the lesson there is that, you know, you uniting behind a common challenge can be uh, important. As always, thanks to our guest for sharing the story. Thanks, Armando and Elise for helping out. Uh, sometime in the future, we have another story from Armando on a bonus episode. It's pretty cool. The guy has lived a lot of lives. For pictures from today's show, follow us on Instagram at Climbing Gold. The show is a production of Duct Tape Thin Beer. Alex Honnold is our host. Today's episode was written and edited by Elizabeth Nakano and me, Fitzka Hall. Additional editing and mixing by Cordelia Zars, who also chipped in on the music. Additional tracks by Brennan O'Connell. Art direction by Anya Miller. Our executive producers for Duct Tape Thin Beer are Lisey Hendricks and Becca Cahal. For RxR Sports, Ben Endy and Jonathan Resnick. Thanks for listening.